Well, fantastic. That was great, and a lot of lot to talk about. Um, I I wanted to back up a little bit from collusion and what's happened since the crash, to talk about the context that existed before, mm -hmm. and. Um, this brings me to all the president's bankers and your mm -hmm. argument there. So in that book, which, as I think I mentioned, is a, it's a, it's a wonderful financial history starting in the late, very late 19th century, but basically 20th, 20th century, of the relationship, the role of the banks in, in, and the relation, their relationship to the government. Basically, you are chronicling the amassing of power particularly by these large, six large banks, um, and their ability to dictate to the government. Um, and this is uh, that comment that I mentioned earlier, government by Goldman for Goldman. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this. Just one, one quick question. I mean, many people have argued it's the military-industrial complex that runs the, runs the country. Others see the power of Silicon Valley sort of why do you think it's the banks? Why are they so important? And what are the consequences of their power? Um, well, well, first of all, that, that, that history is, is important to, to, to gain an understanding for, for the answer to that. Because um, just 100 years so quick before the crisis, um, in 1907, there was something called a panic. Um, in New York, and it was the equivalent of a financial crisis um, in New York. And at the time, there was no insured deposits. Um, and, and, and some of the smaller banks were doing some very shady trading in copper um, with each other. They were trying to corner markets. They were trying to sort of you know, buy it all up and then sort of squeeze the price up and then sort of make a lot of money and come out. People got word of it. Confidence got lost. Um, and, and there were this, you know, these massive panics throughout New York where people were basically being beaten back by policemen at the time to stay away from the doors um, of, of banks when they opened to get their money out and so forth. And so there was, there was a real physical manifestation of, of, of fear in the country. And, and at the time, Teddy Roosevelt, who was the president, um, was, was concerned by this. And um, he had a friend named, named um, J.P. Morgan in New York, and, and he basically um, allowed J.P. Morgan to decide what should happen. And it was kind of the first history of a bailout in the United States. So the Treasury Department allocated at the time $25 million, not trillions, but you know, it, was, it was a scale thing. And they said to J.P. Morgan, you know what, you, you decide basically where to give this around in the financial system in New York so that you just, you just stop this thing from happening. And so J.P. Warren got a bunch of his friends together in, a, in his library in, in, in on Fifth Avenue, and he said, OK, um, how about we just give it to each other? And, <laughs> and, um, and you know, some of those banks we're not particularly friends with anyway. And, and, that, and that's, that's exactly what happened. But the result of that was some, some, some banks went under, like this bank called Knickerbocker Trust, which actually dealt with a lot of sort of lower middle class people in New York, um, went under. And, and everybody that had, um, that JP Morgan sort of had an association with, all those banks, you know, did quite well. But, but the way that, and, and, but it was promoted as a sort of like massive win for everybody. The New York Times had JP Morgan on a, on a cover as being sort of the, the, the king of, of, of the country, and and so and, and Teddy Roosevelt thanked him, and I, I, you know all this kind of stuff, and and that just started this this sort of relationship of sort of abdicating the responsibility of looking at a financial crisis, even from that standpoint, from a strong president, and sort of giving that to the bankers, or, or helping the bankers, or helping a banker in particular, um, and the result of that was J.P. Morgan turned around and said, well. I don't know what's going to happen next time, because frankly, I don't even know the Treasury Department's going to have enough money to handle this. Next. Like, he actually was concerned the Treasury Department wouldn't be there next time. Um, and he was one of the people, and I, I chronicle this in the book, that, that, that actually created um, the philosophies and, and sponsored um, individuals to go to a, a place called Jekyll, Di Jekyll Island, which was a club that he was a member of in, in, in Georgia, or off the coast of Georgia. And, um, get together and sort of manifest what became the Federal Reserve. And the reason for that was to have a, an, an area in, in Washington outside of the Treasury Department that could help banks help themselves in, in a crisis. And that's kind of what, what I was talking about today. But why that's important, it also, it also manifested a relationship, a personal, a very personal relationship, the kind of which lasted for decades, 
um, and through the crash of 1929. So now you have a Fed that was created in 19, um, the end of 1913, started in 1914. You have World War I happen. You have sort of a collaboration between the Morgan Bank and Chase and other major banks at this time um, with the government through war and through you know, a changing world. And so you, you keep relationships going. You're, 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 you're telegraphing presidents during you know, Wilson during World War Time and so forth. And it gets tighter and tighter. And then the 1929 crash happens after an isolationist policy and after a lot of deregulation on Wall Street, because they're all friends. They'd all help you know, the US and, in the war and so forth. Um, and then you have like Goldman Sachs come up. You have Sidney Weinberg, who was the head of Goldman Sachs at the time. There's a crash going on. Goldman's losing all his credibility and money in this crash. So he decides, how do I get my credibility back? Oh, I know, I'll help run FDR. And that's what he did. He helped raise money. Um, for FDR's campaign. Now, we, we subsequently know, know FDR as, as, as a president who, who did you know, many progressive things, the New Deal, FDIC insurance, Glass-Steagall was passed under him, and so forth. But he, he was run by a group of bankers a, as well. Um, and and, and the, the reciprocation for that was Sidney Weinberg got a sort of seat on the business council for FDR. And so even though all these other things were going on, these, these relationships, he was just one of many bankers, but, but a major one who, who then had a relationship with five presidents um, in, in various advisory capacities while he was running Goldman. So, so a lot of this stuff has, has very strong historical ties. And so the difference today in the last sort of two decades is that there's been this complete dislocation between these bankers actually also getting involved in trying to help the real economy or the country in war times, you know, so the military industrial element of it, um, and just caring about their own pockets. Um, and that's where it's become more dangerous and these crises have become more prevalent and their, their role in Washington, like I'll go in and I'll talk to a congressperson and I'll walk out and there'll be like, you know, 12 people coming in from Morgan Stanley and it's like me leaving, it's like, hey guys, you know, and, and so the, the numbers are, are, are very imbalanced and those relationships have been historical, but now they're really about preserving fully themselves as opposed to having some sort of a interaction with the government and in helping sort of a broader population. Like bankers helped Eisenhower pass the acts that created our highways. Um, and actually Weinberg was involved in that, the old head of Chase was involved in that. But that, that was a situation where they had a benefit, the country had a benefit, and, and workers had a benefit, and the economy had a benefit. So it, it was something that was still going on during the military industrial com um, complex period, during Eisenhower's time. I mean, in a positive way, but, but it, it's not like that at all anymore. So um, this question of bailouts and sort of what to do in uh, financial crises and um, sort of thinking about that 1907 in relationship to the 2008, I mean, if, if we think back to what was going on at the time in 2008, um, you know, first with Bush and then Obama, basically they took the view that bailing out the banks would be good for the public. And there was really, you know, almost no imagination or possibility about another way, I would say. Of course, there was a little bit of talk about nationalizing the banks, but it turned out that was, you know, really, you know, very little. And I think Obama didn't have much stomach for doing much out of the, that norm, which as you say, is, is already a century old. Um, so let me just play devil's advocate for a second and say, yeah, they bailed out the banks, but we've had 10 years of almost now, 10 years of growth. Um, has quantitative easing really been so terrible? Uh, was there another path at that time? I mean, what else could have happened? Right, so I actually have a, a number in, in It Takes a Pillage where, um, so, so at the time of, of, of the crisis, there, there was $14 trillion worth of, of toxic assets that had been created by our banks, which was the majority of what there were in the world at the time. And when I say toxic, ones that were somehow associated with the mortgage market. Um, so not ones that they had in, in other forms of, of, of any securities that weren't related. Um, and only a half a trillion dollars of actual subprime mortgages were, were in them. So, so just, just imagine you take, um, you know, you, you know you're, you're making a cherry pie, but you want to sort of skimp on cherries. And so, you, you know, you, you take 
some cherries and then like you mix them with a lot of water and then and then like you put that in the pie and so it, it sort of looks like cherry pie but really the, the sort of factor of cherries to stuff that looks like cherries is, is low so that's kind of what happened with, with, with these subprime mortgages. There was only about a half a trillion that, that were involved in, 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 in what brought down the system. Um, had the policy been, just for example, to, to make the mortgages whole, to basically say to the, the subprime mortgage borrowers who were underwater, um, we're going to either you know, extend to forever your loan, or we're going to give you a really deep discount, or we're going to basically readjust it and, and sort of repay the rest of it so that you can A, stay in your house, and B, not have to incur financial hardship on the other side, and et cetera, et cetera. That the path to doing that by financial engineering would have actually made those $14 trillion worth of assets have value. So it would have done two things. It would have helped all of the mortgage borrowers, and it would have meant that these interest payments that were coming into these assets would keep coming in, because they would be structured accordingly, um, which would mean that, in a sort of perverse but useful sense, these assets would have continued to have value. Um, and they wouldn't have tanked the whole system, because one of the other things that tanked the whole system was that a lot of places were borrowing money to buy these assets, too. So it wasn't just about the $14 trillion of toxic assets that were built upon a half a trillion dollars of subprime mortgages. It was about Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, you know, a small town in Norway, you know, borrowing money in order to, to, to buy them. Um, and so that money also couldn't be repaid because the expectation was they were buying these assets and would get interest on them, and so they would be getting something from them. But when they stop getting anything from them, they still have to pay the money they borrowed to buy them. And so that was one of the reasons the system collapsed around these assets. So, so you could have fixed the entire thing, in my opinion, <laughs> with, with a half a trillion dollars, which would, I mean, the whole world would have been totally different, right? I mean, then you could have had, um, you know, you, you, you basically could have had a situation where all of this decade um, of cheap money and sort of all the money going into the stock market and all this debt that's been created, our, our debt to GDP level in this country is over 100 percent. You know, in Japan, it's over 200 percent. There's, there's a significant amount of borrowing from the future and hoping it'll all be okay that's sustaining you know, the sort of economies or, or the, the, the payments for running the economy of all these countries. You would, I believe, not have had any of that. But, but I mean, I don't know. That's just my. Yeah. That's just the math of it. But I mean, I think one of the other issues is that fiscal policy has been so um, delegitimized by conservatives that we the, that the government really has had to rely so much more heavily on monetary policy because you know there was a small and much too small fiscal stimulus at the beginning of the crash. And then the possibility for any more fiscal stimulus went away. And that's through a fiscal stimulus, we would not have had to, you know, the problem that you identified, which is giving the money to the banks, and then they're not doing with it what we think they should be, which is investing in infrastructure or um, other social investments or small businesses or any good things that, that need to be happening. With fiscal policy, you can directly do that, but it got taken off the table. And that's part of the reason why I think you know, the Fed has had to have such a large program, or I mean, have to. I, they didn't have to, I agree with you. But part of why we're in the situation that we're in of so much, as you call it, conjured money, is because the sort of more appropriate uh, policy for dealing with a crash, particularly a demand crash, which is what happens after a financial crisis, uh, was off the table. Anyway, um, at the end of all the president's bankers, you said, quote, it no longer matters who sits in the White House. Um, after a year of Trump, <laughs> This, what I meant this is was. a mean question, sorry. <laughs> no, no, but the, not the mean part of it. Do you feel that way? But the, the serious part of it is, 
Uh, is Trump in the same structural position with respect to the financial sector that you argued, you know, I think quite rightly, Obama, the Bushes, Clinton, et cetera, have been? Or was, is, is something different with Trump? So just financially. Um, so, so, so the, obviously when, when he campaigned, one of the things that, that he said was that he would not be beholden to, to Wall Street. Um, and then he went and he put in a whole bunch of people from Goldman Sachs into positions of power, including Steve Mnuchin into the Treasury Secretary position. Um, so, so what he did by doing that is, uh, taking out everything else, is, 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 is prove that it, from that respect, the, the people that are sort of running financial policy in the country um, are the same people. So, so, so in that respect, the, 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 the problem that is now happening, though, is that all those people are major deregulation advocates. And so that's where um, it can get worse. Because right now, like Stephen, like one of the things that was in the Republican platform and in the Democratic platform was to reinstate Glass-Steagall. And, and actually, the wording in, in the Republican platform was, was very even more specific than it was in the Democratic platform, which is that they specifically were going to reinstate the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933. And the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933, it's, it's a very short act, and it basically separates into individual institutions with completely separate boards of directors and completely you know, different capital sources, um, commercial banking, so deposits and, and, and savings and loans from any type of speculative banking, creating securities, mergers and acquisitions, any type of more complex operations. That was the point of it. Um, so Steve Mnuchin, who's, who's running the Treasury Department, very quickly told Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and over, over you know, a course of, of Senate hearings and, and just publicly that that's not what they meant. I was actually, I was actually in a meeting a few, right before, when he first said that to Elizabeth Warren, I was, I was in Washington, I was actually meeting with one of the senior people on the Finance Committee, um, who is a Republican, um, and he was also one of the members of the, of the Republican National Committee. So I was actually in RNC um, headquarters meeting with him, and, um, and he, he, he came in, and he was very respectful, and he was like, so, so what is our policy? And the reason he asked me that was because in, Trump's campaigning and in the RNC, it was very clear that the policy would be, or at least what was said it would be, was, was to reinstate Glass-Steagall. And all of a sudden, I was there that day when Steve Mnuchin is basically telling Elizabeth Warren that's not what they meant. And, and he was legitimately confused by this. And, and, I, and, and, he, and he said, what do you think Trump wants to do? And I'm like, oh, he's your guy. I, I, just, I, just, I just think that if you look at, again, overall stability, um, there was a reason that was put in the platform. There was a reason that, that people feel that the banks got a far better deal than they did throughout the country and whoever you voted for. Um, and, and, and there is a situation where, where the Fed and, and therefore the government is, is on the hook for potentially more money if this all goes even more wrong in the future. And there's a reason to assume it will because things haven't been fixed from the last time. And that's what I said in the, in the end of, um, of other people's money. The first book I wrote in 2004, I, I wrote about how derivatives would be a major problem. Um, and in, in fact, credit derivatives and, and, and CDOs, which were part of the toxic asset thing, and, and they were because they just weren't, they weren't regulated products. And, and the banking system had been deregulated as, as per Glass-Steagall being decimated in 1999. So, so Trump coming in is not doing anything different except that some of his, in, in that respect, except that some, he's not pushing what was on the policy, like not once. And on that policy, I'm just, and, um, and his people are, are very deregulatory. The, the fellow's coming in to run the Fed, um, you know, he's a former private equity guy. He's not really into regulating the financial system. In fact, he's been very clear about how the Fed should be positioned more to promote deregulation of the financial system, which was exactly what Alan Greenspan did when he cre you know, helped to create a situation where banks could trade more derivatives with the capital of people's deposits on their books to begin with, and that didn't work out really well. So um, a lot of the people there, the head of the SEC, um, the head of the Consumer Financial Protection Board, who's also still the, 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 the OMB director, Mulvaney, didn't, you know, thought that, quote, it is a joke and doesn't want it and asked for no funding for it this year.
So, so it's actually worse by the people who he's brought in, um, but it's not different from the standpoint of having this allegiance to, to Wall Street. Yeah. Um, I spend a lot of my time working on and worrying about climate change. And, you know, in, in that world, the bad guys are the Cokes and Exxon and BP and Shell and their denier think tanks and so forth. I'm curious about, um, of course, there's been a fair amount of attention lately to banks funding pipelines, but just in terms of your research and experience, how do you see the connections between the fossil fuel industry and the climate denier, you know, the, that sort of the Cokes and their networks and so forth, and Wall Street? So, so kind of like how Wall Street doesn't care about partisanship, it doesn't really care about what side of the climate change arguments it's on. And in fact, it will, you know, banks will absolutely try to fund a pipeline the same day they'll open up a green investment account right now. So for example, it's, it's, so for example um, you know, Goldman was advocating um, for the last couple of years, as were some other major banks, you know, the, these new um, investment creations where, where green energy was a part of it. And they were actually investing quite heavily and, and, and getting private equity money to invest quite heavily in, in solar and in, and in wind and in other types of, of, of cleaner energy and sustainable energy projects. Um, at the same time, their largest clients continue to be Exxon and BP and so forth. So from the standpoint, of, and, and Lloyd Blankfein was advocating um, pro-climate change. And when um, Trump got the US out of the Paris Accords, I think, one of the major bankers actually thought that was a bad idea. I'm, I'm, or at least the banks were positioned to sort of make money out of it by investing in clean on the other side in Europe. So they don't care um, from that standpoint. They, they will figure out a way to make money on, on both sides of that. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left. So I want to talk a little bit about sort of where do we go from here. And you've. You've already talked about an alternative way that we could have gone with after the crash. Um, I'm curious about, you mentioned public banking, uh, crowdsource uh, finance is another, uh, cryptocurrencies, local finance. There's a lot happening, kind of small scale grassroots in terms of uh, the financial sector and alternatives. What, what do you, obviously, uh, re-regulation around Glass-Steagall, but what else are you excited about? What is your vision for how we could uh, sort of, you know, move out of this uh, really dysfunctional relationship between <laughs> finance and the economy to something that could really work for people? Well, again, th th there is the idea that foundational banking, um, and so whether that is um, public banks or, you know, working more with local banks and, and credit unions, um, you know, particularly you see this again in crises, going back to the fire. I actually spoke with um, representatives from um, Wells Fargo that, that was in the town of Ohio, as well as some of the local banks. And the Wells Fargo people weren't particularly invested in anything because, I mean, they were just like an offshoot satellite, you know, office of, of a large institution that basically commits crimes against its its check holders all the time. So, um, and the guy I talked to was very nice. I mean, he, but, but it, it was just that idea that like they don't, it doesn't matter. Whereas um, the more local banks realize that if they don't find a way to help um, in an emergency or in general, you know, so, so with the local businesses, then, then that entire local economy suffers and then they ultimately suffer. And so it's, 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 it's easier to um, have that connection and then sort of solidify stuff on the ground. So I just, I just think that's generally important. One of the things that, that is interesting about that on a global scale, um, for example, is, is you know, as I mentioned, that, that's something that, that, that China and some, some Southeastern Asian countries are trying to do with each other, um, which is to take funds and put them directly into infrastructure. So even though there's artificial funds being created and there's debt being created, there's, there's a plan for a lot of it to go and do something that has a long-term um, benefit. And we, for example, on the national scale, aside from um, reinstating Glass-Steagall and therefore, you know, sort of taking away some of that capital boost that we've given to these, these institutions, um, could have an infrastructure bank as well. And that infrastructure bank on a national level by diverting some of the debt we've already been created to, to be the capital for that bank and not have these like quibbles 
and this is the other conversation I have in Congress with both sides, is like you're, you're quibbling over $200 billion and whether like you cut this and you give that and you know, whether you, you know, all, all these sorts of really just, just stressful conversations. You know, you could have an infrastructure bank funded by debt we already have created um, that could actually go and allocate money to do things. Um, and then that could partner with public banks at a, at a sort of state level or, or a local level, and that could partner um, with, with smaller, even private banks. And, and you could have just a, a healthier um, tiered system rather than having all of the capital support go to the top of that system. Yeah. Well, that's a great uh, thought to end on. So <laughs> thank you very much thank for you. a wonderful, thank you. wonderful Thank evening. you, guys. <laughs>